listening to the Neil Amps Show. My name's Joey, and I'm joined by Paul. All right, mate. And by Neil. Hello. Uh, let's start off with the question on everybody's lips this week. You've already made two attacking substitu- substitutions to try and turn the game round, and you've got one left. Where's the duck? <laughs> what are you doing to us? I... It was the main reason I went you, Dewey. You turned up especially to see him. I wanted to see what was going on. I wanted to see Uh, why people were using duck emojis. I wanted to see what all the fuss was about. In fact, after that game, I had quite a significant feeling of what was all the fuss about previously then. Like, I had clearly been to the wrong game out of the four that had proceeded. Um, That he killed Joy. That's what the problem is. Robbins is a killjoy. He's seen... He's seen that people enjoy it, and that's it. Nah, I'm not bringing them on. No way. We'll probably aim to dissect that decision and many others in uh, minute detail as we go through this, but let's start off with moments of the week. Paul, do you want to kick us off? I can't... Um, uh, I, yeah, that substitution, I think, was really sort of quite quite pertinent, because also it was at the point where he was obviously going to take off Vincenzi, um, as I'm attempting this week, but Willis <laughs> sort of walked off. No, that's all I'm going to have my moment of the week. Um, I think it's Chris Coleman on Twitter sort of went, I didn't understand why um, Doyle was playing so deep, and then I realised it was because the aim was to take the ball off Jordan Willis as quickly as humanly possible. Why is and Chris Coleman like, commentating on our game? <laughs> I, think, I think he, there are two people called Chris Coleman. Oh, that, oh, that's the thing, is it? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is a non-manager, um, Chris oh. Coleman. This is just no, a- this, is, okay. this, is, this is a tweet from a fan. And it was like... And I, I, read, I, I read certain things, and someone sort of went, well, Jordan Willis was my match, because his distribution was quite good. <laughs> and I was just like, I've missed, I, I've missed that, that game. And, mm. But then seeing that tweet was like, ah, someone else saw um, Jordan Willis punting the ball out. And then I read Neil's block, and it was like... Oh, Neil saw Jordan Willis unable to pass to a teammate as well. There was me thinking I'd lost the plot, but um, no. And I know I, and I'm massive hater of generalisations of footballers, but Jordan Willis can't pass. He just can't. He physically can't. And he just he just showed that again on Saturday with just some horrific can't passing. It's quite frustrating, isn't it? Um, Neil, your moment of the week. I thought it was tricky this week to think of anything particularly good. I, d- I got to shout Tony really loud at Tony, which was, <laughs> that, well, that was pretty decent. He came over for a corner, and I thought, I'm not going to have this moment until you know, next time I have a corner. So I thought, let's shout Tony really loud. And I did, and people around me thought I was a bit peculiar, which is their right to think that. But no, my moment of the week was a um, friend of the show, Corey Adai, followed me, which I thought was um, very nice. So now I have to be mindful of saying he's small or anything. Yeah, lovely Corey Adai, um, retweeting every tweet that's got his name in it. I think that's really, um, I think that's really sweet, isn't it? I think. I hope it's really sweet. Yeah, like you say, that's um, yeah. Ooh, let's hope so. I'm going to go for another Jordan Willis related one, but it's not particularly against Jordan Willis. It's just something that I have a massive beamy bonnet about all the time. We had a moment in the second half, and it was probably more noticeable because it's right where we stood where Jordan Willis took one of his long throws in and aimed the ball into the near post. And as it happened, their defender uh, had this marvellous flick on back across his own goal that found nobody. And, I, and I, I couldn't help... I mean, I was already boiling over with frustration at the time, but I couldn't help but think, under what circumstances do you take a long throw into the near post... For a, and flick on presumably from your own player, yeah. but you're assisted by one of theirs, where there's three defenders attacking the ball and not a single attacker within 15 yards of it. Yeah, I thought that as well. That was really noticeable, wasn't it? It was just daft. It, it happened a handful of times. That was the most noticeable one. But you just think, you bear in mind that they made a big deal out of Jack Grimmer's goal last week being straight from the training ground. You're like... the. Yeah, that's great. There's, there's maybe more fundamental stuff that you need to work on, like the very sort of specific <laughs> mechanics of how you might score a goal. Um, Neil, you're going to talk about the um, the game, if you can bear it today. Where do you want to start? It's, it's a difficult one. It's, I think 
if you think broadly, it was it was just disappointing to kind of to see the level of performance drop so so much from everybody on the pitch, pretty much, which is it's, it's just unusual. I mean, like you can kind of accept a few players each game are going to let their standards drop. And I think it was a drop in standards. I mean, I know some people think we haven't played really particularly very well this year, but I, I think there have been some good performances out there. But on Saturday, we just started in a really sort of tame manner. And it was, it, I mean, for me, I think it was it was quality more than anything else. It was just a consistent lack of sort of quality passing and giving the ball away time after time, which seemed to... I mean, this happened in the first sort of half an hour where it was just lax play from players where they weren't judging the passes, they weren't didn't have any conviction in the passes, and it just seemed to set the tone for the the match in itself. And by the second half, where we were really sort of forced into it once they got the goal, it was just we'd run out of any sort of confidence or any belief in our ability, our ability to sort of create anything. So it was just really sort of disappointing especially for like for you because you come along to watch this game and you'd had us saying oh you know we're a good team this year and then you you have to watch that which is very very poor I mean the odd thing is we I, I find it hard to believe that we can play much poorer than that this season given what we've seen so far to this point and then that performance and yet we lost by uh, an absolutely ridiculous goal um, it was just it, it was it was a daft way to lose a match really I think, I mean, defensively, they, they didn't offer, uh, they didn't sort of prevent, provide any sort of threat to us. I didn't think. I thought McDonald, of all the players on the pitch, was probably the most solid. Um, we've mentioned Willis already. I think defensively, from that side of his game, he's always pretty good. He's, dare I say, it, he's a good athlete. He's he's good at doing those sort of things. But I, it's always offset by this really frustrating level of distribution and I've got no issue with him playing long balls and let them let there if we need the problem is that, that the man seems to have absolutely no finesse in his foot at all he just cannot judge the weight even vaguely how it should be I mean the amount of times he just absolutely smashed the ball far past his target it's just I, I can't quite fathom it because um, I always thought he'd be quite a sort of culture defender but I think over the last um, 18 months or so I've come to the realisation that um, Jordan Willis is not a culture defender he no. is um, he is very much um, a strong sturdy defender with um, little um, creativity <laughs> in his feet um, when you compare that to someone like Jordan Clark who was very much a culture defender um, yeah I just think there was a few too many players who were far below par I think um Stokes had a, a very poor game, a left wing. I just think he, was, he doesn't seem at it so far this season. And I mean, I, without wanting to steal listener questions, I did see one question about what do we do um, on that left hand side uh, once the sort of Haynes is, is back. And I think the, qu- the answer in my mind is certainly we get Haynes back in that team because it, he, I've never had too much of an issue with him defensively. And I think going forward, he certainly does offer far more than what um, Chris Stokes is able to do. I mean, that's not to say I don't want Stokes anywhere near the, near the team. I think there's still an argument to say that he's, when he's in one of those manic moods of his, he's actually a really good central defender. But, I mean, that performance was um, pretty poor. I think the did most... You, no- Go on, carry on. Sorry, did you, did you see the, the thing I posted earlier? Which last, se- last season, he started five league games. No, three league games, or five. And Vincenzi started... Three, I think. So Vincenzo started three league games and Stokes had started five. And you can see that both of them look like they haven't played a lot of football recently. They're both looking very leggy quite quickly and they're both looking lacking in confidence. Yeah, that's the one, isn't it? I think they're both looking so lacking in sharpness and I guess training is a completely different thing and I'm sure... They do different things in training, but when it comes to the match situation, I, I mean, I can't remember seeing Stokes look quite so sort of off the pace. Or he, he's such a sort of. I'm going to copy. Who called him a warrior? Was it? Um, who was our last manager? Not the one before um, Slade. Uh, Venus. Mowbray. Uh, Mowbray. Mowbray. There we go. God, that was hard work. <laughs> um, yeah, he called him a warrior, and he's always been that sort of player. So even if he's not sort of technically as good as a player he's up against, you always fancied him to deal with him in some way. 
Um, he's not dealing with people very well at the moment. And yeah, I mean, Vincenti's making it difficult for people to um, sort of warm to him because he's he's not doing much. I guess that's the problem. He's not doing much with the ball and he doesn't seem sort of alert to the sort of the speed of the match or anything yet. And I mean, that frustrated me more than anything on Saturday was just how slow it took him to kind of get rid of the ball. And that's not to say one of the rush, but there were so many occasions where he got the ball and the pass presented itself. And certainly when you're a player and you're lacking confidence, make the pass, just gain that confidence, but don't hold on to it. Um, till the end of time because you are going to get tackled and that's what happened far too many times so I mean that was disappointing I mean I think the most prevalent player for me who the drop from one game to the other was probably Kelly in the middle who I I was pretty impressed with against Grimsby especially second half I thought he came out and he 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 performed really well both sort of from a a midfield general point of view and also with the ball but, but his his passing was um way off the mark and from the start really he just couldn't get his rhythm at all he was he was kind of um committing to passes far far sooner than he needed to and he was kind of playing them and then there was already a player intercepting and it was just it was odd to see and I don't I don't want to judge him for that because I mean the way I always look at these things is I've seen him before far perform far better than that in the the previous two games so kind of that's there's his capability. I don't want to judge him for having a bad game and say, oh, cool, that maybe that's what his level is. When actually, if there's a capability there and there's like a confidence about him, he's more than capable of passing a football to a teammate. So what happened in my mind on Saturday, especially him personally, was it has to be sort of a blip. That, that's, that's not him. That's not normal. Surely not. Because um, it's just it was just too, too drastic. Um, so oh. it's it just disappointing to see him drop that, that far away from the quality I'd seen before. I wanted to ask you a question about Kelly. It struck me on Saturday that it seemed like people wanted the vast majority of our play to go through him. Is that what you saw in the other games that he's played? Not really, actually. No, he was very much a Doyle. It was like having two Doyles in the middle. But when he got the ball, he was really quite careful with it and really quite considered. And there was no daftness. He was just making sure he he got the pass to the right person. But it just... So much on Saturday just didn't come off for him, and whether that was it became a lack of confidence or what, I'm not sure. But it was it was just so far from what I'd seen in the previous games. I, I, I'm finding it difficult to believe that's something he's going to um, do again. It just felt like one of those matches where he was falling so far short of the standards, and then it just became a thing almost where every time he got the ball. The, the, the pressure was just too immense for him to keep it almost, and he just he gave it away, and there was no there was no sort of um, reason why he wasn't going to get um, substituted when he did because he, it, the game was just going from it. He wasn't nothing was going his way, and it was we were just forcing the issue by the end of it, and he, he wasn't he wasn't going to have a good game. He was never going to turn that around, so just um, it made sense to switch it. Basically, what, frust- what frustrated me most about Kelly on Saturday was that he. Most of it, yeah, we gave the ball away a lot. What frustrated me most is in that game against the way that Newport set up was he gave the ball away a lot in needless situations. It wasn't like he gave the ball away trying to force the issue with a pass between the lines, yeah. or it was just. And there was one really pertinent moment. I think it was in the first half where he carried the ball like 10, 15 yards forward from the defence, and had already sort of got in his mindset he was going to pass to Doyle. And when he finally passed to Doyle, Doyle had a man on him, and Doyle just like basically just kicked the ball away. And you were like, you you didn't need to pass that ball to Doyle. You you didn't need to pass that ball at all. You just just keep keep on the ball, keep looking at your options. And one of the things that I think was really pertinent when Ben Stevenson came on was I think Ben Stevenson's first pass was just a forward ten yards pass, and you were like that. That pass was has been on <laughs> quite a lot this game. I don't understand why Kelly didn't try it more often. It, it seemed like he was obsessed with only passing the ball sideways, and or directly think, to a, an opposition player, as was the case most of the time. Yeah, and it was just that in that game when we had the two destroyers and the way that New, Newport set up, where they had nothing to destroy, they had no. They didn't really. Basically, Newport's conceded up till about ten yards into their half. They were yeah. like, 
you've got this. You, you don't. <laughs> we're not challenging you for the ball. You've got time and space. It, in some extent, it was strange that it took so long for Ben Stevenson to come on, and it's. It was almost prompted by the goal. It was like shit. We're one nil behind. It's like we've been the second. We've been the the inferior of the two sides all game. Ben Stevenson should have been on like twenty minutes earlier because just having that player who. All he was looking at, Stevenson, was forward. Not all of his passes worked. No one's going to say he came on and was suddenly Glenn Hoddle. But just having someone with a different mindset. And it, it for, for me, for my issue with Kelly wasn't the fact he gave the ball away. That happens. We're in League Two. It was the, the lack of attacking mindset that worried me. It was the fact that he wasn't even trying. From, from really early on, he wasn't trying to play those passes which we needed him to play. I'm not sure if that's entirely true. I mean, he, I think he, he did keep trying them, but the problem was they just, none of them, I don't think any of his forward passes came off. And it, I guess that that hindered his mindset, surely. I mean, if you're trying all these attacking passes and every time they, I mean, I don't know how old he is. He's he's probably mid-twenties, isn't he? But he just, he just seemed, it was quite sort of a, a youthful um, approach to football where he allowed those previous mistakes to sort of hinder his game eventually. And, you know, like you say, eventually he kind of, went into his shell far too much, and that's when he needed to get taken off. But I, I certainly saw plenty of attacking passes from him. But like, like I say, none of them seemed to go to their man. And that's pretty much why he had to come off, because um, we needed to force the issue. And he just didn't have it in his locker that day. He wasn't alone either, was he? I thought that mm. the first half was noticeable for nothing other than the sheer number of misplaced passes like a almost bizarre number of misplaced yeah. passes it seemed to be that once the ball got to the halfway line it didn't matter who was on the ball it was given away phenomenally cheaply in a way that we've joked before about players like Doyle playing it directly out of play or behind players or whatever but this just seemed to be consistently to the feet of an opposition player it was it was really jarring at times but isn't there also the argument that there was nothing really... There were, that front, the attacking four, the, the, the Jones on the right, Vin, Vincenzi on the left, and McNulty and Bevan weren't really providing decent options either. We didn't... That, that four didn't look like a cohesive attacking unit. So for Newport, who sat basically a bank of four, bank of three, and then two Y players who were dropping quite deep... We didn't have the pace or the movement off the ball, which which made them have to um, move out of position. It was th- there were easy balls to intercept because they weren't being moved around. It was interesting when New Tony came on for five ten minutes when he was buzzing around and suddenly was on the right, suddenly was on the left. He went deep, he went forward. That finally we'd got to the point where Newport were beginning to. And again, the game was over 60, 70 minutes long, so tiredness probably came in as well. But it was at that point where we were beginning to find forward passes because Newport weren't as, as easily set defensively. They, they were beginning to be stretched and moved around. And I think that's one of the things that came out of the game for me on Saturday, and it'll be interesting, Neil's one, is I don't... I, my worry with that starting strike partnership, I've, I've only seen them twice, but in neither game have I really seen a goal threat from either of them and against Newport if I'd have been a defender for Newport I, I think I'd have had a quite an easy day which is, is very worrying for a home team No I, I think that's fair I mean certainly in terms of the movement up front it's I mean I'm, I'm a, an open fan of Bevan I think he's a really useful player and sometimes it's not quite as noticeable as um, what you'd like but I, I see a lot of good stuff in him but he I mean for the first 30 minutes I don't think he must have touched the ball about three times he was he was nowhere to be seen and whether that was good marking or, or what I don't know it, it just you can't you can't deal with that I mean especially in a team where we've only like say only got a, a few creative players they need they need those outlets and we were lacking them I mean I think McNulty's got something about him I think and and against a certain formation I think he could be quite quite handy but it was just noticeable that our two strikers were so similar at the weekend and they were so quiet as well and it it, it made it difficult and um, that said most of the passes that we should have made um well, we should have made because they, they were quite simple um there was a lot of very very easy passes um to open players but 
I think there there was a wider problem there in terms of not having anybody who was really going to cause their defence much of an issue. Um, and obviously moving on to Jody Jones, I, I I don't want to pick on the specific moment, but there was a moment where he, he kind of fell over the ball. He tried to use his right foot and he collapsed. And that may have been the second half. It may have been quite late on in the game, but that something happened after that moment where he just seemed a completely different player. He just whether that knocked his his confidence as well, I don't know. But he he certainly wasn't the, the threat that we thought he was going to be. Um, it, he just wasn't running at him in the same way that we saw against Grimsby. So it was just sort of disappointing, really. And I guess that's why when in the second half we made those changes, I I, I was desperate to see you know the duck come on because I think we needed just that actual threat, that genuine threat of someone who was going to make their defence think. And for what we've seen of Biami so far, he is a, he's a big guy and I think he kind of positioned himself quite well, but he's not, he doesn't kind of work to get the ball. He's one who allows the ball to come to him and he may do something if it gets to him, but whereas the duck is a constant threat from what I've seen and it was, it just felt, it felt a very odd decision that we wouldn't, at that stage in the game where desperation was kind of kicking in, where we wouldn't just throw him on just to cause a little bit of a, a bit of a nuisance and just to see what he could could create. I mean, conversely, the one sort of thing I could look at from Bobby's perspective was that we did, at that point, have sort of creative players on the pitch. So, new Tony Stevenson was on. Players were starting to link in a in a nicer way, and you do wonder what you know the duck up front whether he would kind of you know, sort of deflect that and kind of be the wrong kind of person up front for him. But at the same time, I think we've seen enough of him to know that he's he's a fairly clever player as well. And I'm sure he could be quite, quite a nice wall for some of those passes coming in from Stevenson. So it, it was it was just disappointing not to see him give him the go because I think given the choice and based on what we've seen so far, and I know it's only been three games, he he's the man, he's the game changer. And um, I think it was kind of primed for him on Saturday. What do you think of um, New Tony? I liked him. I, think, I mean, it, you kind of treat that performance in isolation because he was doing what he could do, but he didn't really have anybody else to work with. But yeah, I like the look of him. He, he seems really clever. He seems um, very keen to get onto the football. I mean, my concern is how we fit him into the current formation without yeah. losing a striker. I think it's um, it'll be difficult and I don't really want to lose the striker in League 2 I think the way you get out of this league is by finding ways to score goals um, so it, it kind of it needs a bit of um, cleverness from Robbins really in terms of fitting him in and I do think he will try and fit him in because I don't think we're the team yet where we can afford to leave out really good players and he, he does seem to be one of those I, Just in terms of when you were mentioning Nazon being a game changer I mean it, you can't read anything into a 20 minute performance from Andrew necessarily but, well, actually, I guess you can read small amounts into it. Yeah. But that he had the most meaningful self-created effort that pulled a really good save from their keeper, who I thought, without being sensational, was really solid. Um, and he also laid that back heel through to, I want to say McNulty, but I don't think it was. Who did he play through for that really that good that good chance? Was it McNulty? It may have been, or was it the Yeah, yeah. Who, well, whoever it, whoever it was. But they were two moments of sort of self-created ingenuity that um, that I don't think we saw from anybody else at no. all on the day. He, I thought he looked really. I thought he looked really bright. I thought it was quite a promising start. Well, the other thing that frustrated us about, and we were discussing this at the time about the, the bringing on of um, Maxime, was the fact that we'd seen that Bevan and McNulty hadn't worked, and we brought on a player who was very similar. <laughs> to McNulty and Bevan. I mean, if he was lightning quick or really tricky on the ball or really, you know, physical, strong um, presence or he was really tall, you'd be like, oh, OK, I understand that. It's, you're trying he's something. Tall, isn't he? He's quite he's, tall, he's five it, foot I, nine. Five no, I, look, Bevan, I looked it up. Yeah, on, the website, he's, 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 on the website, it says that he's six foot because me and Paul had this conversation in the car on the way home and I was saying I, the, the problem that he's got for me is what Paul is describing there. He's not especially tall. He's not especially quick. In fact, there was one moment in the second half where I thought, actually, you look like you might be quite slow, like Vincenzo <laughs> slow. Um, he's not. He doesn't seem particularly strong, particularly good in the air. 
And it's it's very very difficult, I imagine, when you're a player coming up from a league below, to impress when you don't have a noticeable trait to your game. So if you're yeah, Jamie yeah. Vardy, for example, your pace is what sets you apart, and the rest of it sort of it's you know academic because you're just blazing past people. And someone like Charlie Austin was scoring goals no matter what level he was at, despite not having much of a thing. But he was just a good instinctive finisher. Whereas Biamu just seems to be... he I, like, I don't want to read anything into what I've seen so far, but it's he doesn't have a, a niche, does he? So it's very difficult to pick up on what he adds. And the, I think that was the frustration for me with him coming on instead of Nazon. At the very least, it looks like Nazon is a different player than what we had on. And you're absolutely right, Paul, in that Bevan and McNulty laboured the same game, which I don't think fits together anyway, especially not together at all within that four. And then to bring on a player that was almost identical, it did just seem strange to me. There you go. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to throw my tuppence on Bevan. I feel sorry for Bevan because while he doesn't really impress me and his goal scoring isn't particularly brilliant, I think if you're a team like he was at Burton where you're going to be under the cosh quite a lot, and when he's been at his best for Cov is when we've been under a bit of pressure and we've punted the ball into the corners and he's had to, he's made defenders' lives hard. And he's one of those players who needs to play against the high line and really sort of be a nuisance, be a pain in the arse. And against Newport, who basically seek conceded possession, conceded territory, I don't see how he fits in because I, I don't think his first touch is particularly good. I don't think he's the sort of striker who's, who's looking to get beyond the, the, the defenders, even with the limited space that we, we had, and he's not particularly a link man. So I think in a team where, and I think this is, you know, Newport is very much, I think we have to accept the way that Newport came to the Rico is going to be very much the sort of game we're going to get week in, week out. Is Bevan capable of adapting his game enough to get in and around the box and create chances for other people or have chances created for him. I, I would suggest not. And that's and one of the things that really stood out for me on Saturday was um, I think Kelly had the ball and was driving forward and there was a really nice gap for Bevan to run into, which would have really helped Kelly out, would have given him a good option, but would have also put Bevan through. And he didn't make the run until it was too late, until it was almost like the only thing he could do was make that run. And I watched that and think, for a 33-year-old, not making that run makes me believe that he's ne- you know that that run isn't isn't in his game. That isn't what he wants to do. That's fine. I think all strikers are different, but at times on Saturday, I just looked at him and just thought, "Is this really? Are we going to get the best out of you if teams come and sit with a really deep line defence and, and the midfield, which is great and giving you no space?" I'm not sure. I, I, I don't. You know. I think he's on a 12-game for Cov goalless run at the moment. It's it's quite a long time since he last scored a league goal. And from what I've seen, which is only the two games, he he doesn't look like breaking that anytime soon. And for me, I think we have to start looking at some of the other options because he's not a goal scorer. He's, he's not. You know, he hasn't been since he's come into league football. So. For me, he's one of those players where I think we we might need to start looking at alternatives. I agree with your your broad point. I think um, he's one who works in a certain type of system. And whether that system is playing alongside McNulty, who's quite similar, um, that's still to be sort of understood. I I, I do think he's got a good first touch. I, that's one of his um, talents, I think, that's um, quite prominent. Um the issue is he doesn't get on the ball enough to kind of showcase it. But um, that's one point I would kind of pull you back on in terms of my perspective. I, I do think he's got quite a good first touch. But um, we, we could talk about the nuances of Stuart Bevan all day long. Um, the one and thing we, we haven't mentioned... And we shall. Um, Let's make this the first eight-hour <laughs> podcast um, where we just talk about Stuart Bevan, yeah? Stuart Bevan podcast would be um, extremely good. But um, I was going to mention just the keeper because we haven't, we haven't said anything about their goal, which I feel... Um, Obviously, it was the, the turning point in the match. Um, it wasn't very good, was it? What he did? He's um, had a mare, I think, is the technical term for it. Yeah. It, I think it's just it's one of those things, isn't it? I think, to some extent, it is, again, 
going from the Newport game, I think it's something you, whoever's in goal for Coventry is going to have to get used to. At home, they might have 20 minutes where the ball doesn't come anywhere near them. And it's a different mentality. I think you, yep. whoever's in goal has got to be prepared to basically be a spectator for a bit and then only be switched on at certain times. It's going to be difficult. I mean, his best game was clearly, well, for me, the one I've seen was the Blackburn game where he was involved every five, six minutes and it was all about making saves and, and it was you could see he had to be switched on at all times. Against Newport, there were periods where he just didn't need to be switched on and it's, it's something he's going to have to learn. Neil, did you want to add any further thoughts on, on Liam O'Brien? I mean, the, the thought really is that there's suddenly, because he's made this mistake, the sort of murmurings around, oh, do we bring in Burge now? Is, is that mistake um, something that we need to punish? Um, I've, I've never really, really been of the mindset. I'm kind of with Paul on this one where the, the nature of the game is kind of what, caused that it was it was pure sort of lack of concentration and I think Robbins tried to attribute it to him already thinking about what was going to happen after he'd made that save and he, he just um he's made a, an error I mean I guess the positive I can take from that is when you make errors like that it doesn't have to put it in your mind the next time you have a shot like that to really focus so while it's annoying that it's happened and it's ultimately cost us the, the match if for the rest of the season, he's got that Im- embedded in his mind, and he's so focused on, you know, not being lax when the ball's coming to him like that. Then maybe, dare I say, maybe it's um, it's worth it. Maybe it's worth him conceding at one time early on, so that um, he actually shows a bit more focus in the future. I mean, I don't, I don't want to see people punished for single mistakes because mistakes happen. Um, and it's a shame that was such a an important one, but his broad performances to so far have been solid enough I don't I mean I don't think he had a particularly good game all round I think his kicking was a, a, a bit wild it seems to be a bit of a struggle for him kicking whereas Burge while it's still a pretty erratic he's got a bit of a smooth emotion if um, that's even anywhere important for a goalkeeper so yeah I, I'm, I'd stick with him personally I think he's um, he's already shown enough to me to suggest that he's he's had a good start to the season and while that's an annoying mistake um, I I I very much doubt he'll make that one again um, Q next week when he does exactly the same thing. Two things I would just flag up with that. One, um, I noticed that about his kicking. It's like he kicks with the full force of his body. Like yeah. He becomes really it's airborne not... and sort of starfishy. It's um, it's unorthodox, I guess, is what you'd describe it as. It, I, I guess it doesn't make much difference, but it wasn't. he's quite an interesting player to watch, isn't he? Some players have got that sort of weird physicality where they're quite sort of captivating to watch just yeah. play the game because they don't look like the others play, v- vincenzi has got it and uh, in, yeah. in that he just doesn't look like a footballer that's not a criticism he just moves differently and everything and o'brien with all the shouting and all of the kicking and everything is like he's playing for the first time but he's just all right at it the second thing I'd say is just, and this is, you know, I know there's huge contextual differences between the two, but it's worth as an illustrative point. Hugo Lloris made an awful mistake on, not yep. an awful mistake on Sunday, but a, but a mistake. And actually, for someone that's characterised as one of the best keepers in the world, I think he makes quite a few mistakes. But you'd have to be a lunatic to be calling for him to be pulled out of the team because he let that goal in against Alonso on on Sunday. It just it's just too short termist, isn't it, to make one yeah. mistake and then go well. That means you've got to come out of the team. Then we whinged all last season, and I don't think any of us are saying about O'Brien coming out of the team. But I guess to other people, a lot of people whinged last season, and especially with Mowbray about all the rotation and not having a fixed first eleven. You do have to wonder where your priorities are if you're then calling for O'Brien to be removed because he's made one admittedly pretty titanic level mistake well that's the risk with everything isn't it really um at this stage we're gonna because we don't have enough sort of points of reference we're going to make sort of snap judgments because it's the only thing we can do we're looking at these games almost in isolation and you sort of you're having to judge people on snippets rather than a sort of concerted period of time so it's a risk, and not that we have any real influence over these things. We're not the ones picking the team, and I'd like to think that Robbins has got far more to judge things off. But it's it's just it's it doesn't sit comfortably with me not having enough to go by. I, I don't because 
your natural reaction when you watch that game is to be frustrated. We just lost, played really poorly, and sort of everything I'm thinking is, oh, God, that's, that was absolutely rubbish, and I just want to scream at them. But at the same time, I look at it and I'm like, ugh, it was just game. There's, there's, there's a, a possibility that the next game could be completely different again. And it's just not at that point, I don't think, where we can make these snap judgments because we, we're all still learning, aren't we? Yeah. So, I sort of agree and disagree. Well, it's sort of like the, Vin, the Vincenzi thing. As I said earlier, Vincenzi didn't really start many league games last season. And he came, he was fit towards the end of the season. And Keith Hill, um, Rochdale's manager, used him as a sub a lot towards the end of the season. He made about 10 sub appearances. And then... Having been at Rochdale for four years, he released him, and he's only 31. And the only thing going through your head, my head, is I, I quite trust Keith Hill as a, as a manager. And he's not obviously known Peter Vincenzi for a long time. And he's suddenly come to the decision that he's not even worth a one-year contract. And you just you, you, you question yourself, he's like, what what happened? What was that injury, and what's it done to him that has made Keith Hill come to the conclusion after he'd been a success at Rochdale? And I think we all accept he had been a success at Rochdale for him to be released. And what I find really interesting about the, another thing I find really interesting about Vincenzi is the fact we play him on the left wing, where if you look through his career, he's he's very very rarely played at Rochdale. From what I understand, he was very much. Of, of the right of a front three and one of the things I like from the Newport game and as I said I think a lot of teams will come to Coventry and do what Newport did is they they had a right they had a left back with a right foot and that that really did hinder Jones because every time he cut back onto his strongest foot for the first time in a while he played against a defender who was also on his strongest foot and Jones took, was a bit taken aback by that and I, I agree that he wasn't his best performance but I think it was the first time that also sort of Newport double teamed him because they knew what we knew. You know, these clubs have scouts. They look at it like we did and they went, Coventry have got one attacking threat and that's Jody Jones. And behind him, Grimmer, who we haven't really discussed, who again <laughs> had quite a poor game. And then on the left, they just went, well, they've got Stokes and Vincenzi. That's, there's nothing there. And Joey made a really pertinent point on our way home. You almost got the time, the feeling at the time that the Cov players got the ball, looked at Vincenzi and Stokes, and went, "I don't fancy that," and went back down the right because they didn't trust Vincenzi and Stokes to create anything either. And one thing we haven't really discussed is I, I looked at the bench. We had two centre halves and a creative midfielder, and then the three strikers. And you were like, "Well." Do we really need in League Two to have two solid centre halves on the bench? Um, do we sort of? I would have brought, you know, if it had been available, someone like Dion Kelly Evans or someone like De- Devon Kelly Evans, who are players who have the ability to take a player on and create space. Because the way you break teams down who defend that deep is you, you go around the wings, and we had one wing all game, and it it's what I've come out of that game going, if I was Newport going to the Rico, I would have set up how, how Newport did. And I think a lot of teams are going to do that. And my worry is they asked us questions, which I don't think we answered. I, I agree. It was a bad, you know, players play badly. That happens. But I think it was, it's not a coincidence that we played badly against a team who basically came not to lose. And that's going to happen this season. So, how are we gonna how are we gonna break those teams how are we gonna break those teams down? How are we going to move them around? How are we going to expose them and get them because one thing that never happened or didn't appear to happen against Newport is Jody Jones very rarely had a one on one battle with his fullback where he, he had like ten metres to run into, which is what he's done all season and been brilliant at, where he's been in a proper foot race with a player, ball at his feet. Against Newport they didn't allow that to happen. And Newport aren't, you know, they're not one of the stronger teams in the division, but they're probably, they've given the template for how teams are going to come. So for me, I think we definitely need another winger. I mean, Vincenzi might come good in five, 10, 15 games because we've had discussions in the past and we know that 
footballers in the past have said sometimes it takes about a year to get back from an injury or you've got to be, you've got to be back for as long as you're out. That's fine. But because I don't, because Vincenzi and Stokes seem to be so much at the same level of not being ready, that whole left hand side doesn't offer anything apart from Vincenzi winning the occasional headers. And the other thing is because Vincenzi is so much taller than the rest of our team, if you were playing against Cov, you'd be like, oh, okay, they're going to kick it long to Vincenzi because they're not going to kick it long to Jones, McNulty or Bevan because they're not going to win it in the air. And what happened quite a few times against Newport is they just let Vincenzi win the ball and they knew that he was going to flick it on and they just stood behind him and, and took the second ball. It's, we, we need to make sure that we we fell into quite a lot of traps, I felt, on Saturday. We, we went down quite a lot of obvious routes and Newport were ready for it. I think we need to make sure that we have a lot more variety going forward and if that's not in the squad, then I, I don't see us having the five strikers we've got. Well, six, if you include Kwame Thomas, you can't even get on the bench. I'd rather swap one or two of those for a couple more wingers or players with defined pace, because I think that's what we're going to need at times. I think it's very difficult to say outright that it's um, not a coincidence that um, we weren't able to deal with a team like Newport because we've only really played one team so far. It's very hard to say that's already an issue. It was an issue on that day and we need to be sure that we can deal with it. But there's there's no there's not really anything we can judge on. We, we've had that one game and we struggled against it. But that's not to say next time around we, we, we won't play differently. I, I think it could be an issue, but certainly not a definitive one. Yeah, we, we, we simply don't know, do we? But I think, as I said, we discussed this before the start. We were looking at the squad and there is there is nothing coming from that left-hand side. Those two players have got to improve remarkably in the next game or going forward. That dynamic of that partnership is definitely a hindrance at the moment. I think we can all agree on that. And, they I, well, and yet, let's we, say we, this. Got, we got two wins. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we did. So it can't be that much of a hindrance. Well, the thing is, it's like we did, and it depends how you want to look at these things. Against Notts County, it was a very open game, and Jody Jones had a great game and scored a hat trick. Against Grimsby, from what, again, I can only say from what I understand, and speaking to people who were, who were there, the first half was dire. In the second half, we were better, but we didn't score until Nathan Clark made that mistake. And. Then we score from a free kick, uh, corner. Great, we're all happy with score from corners. But on on Saturday in open play, we didn't create much, and we didn't create anything at all from that side. And that that from I mean I could be completely wrong, and we could go to Yeovil and we could hammer them five 0 and Vincenzi could be brilliant. But I'm looking at it and going, I I worry that if teams come and set up like Newport did, that from this, what I've seen of the squad and what I know of the squad, there isn't a lot of creativity there. And that that is, especially with the fact that strikers don't seem to be creating, you know, in three games, I, I don't think I've seen Bevan have a shot. And th- that was against, in two games we've won. It's that there are, I don't think we can go, look, we were brilliant for two games, we were awful for one, therefore we are brilliant. I think we have to look at it and say, as the season goes forward, when teams come and do certain things against us, do we have the variety? And it might not be within the team itself, but on the bench to make things happen. For me on Saturday, the team didn't couldn't cope with what was going on. They played poorly, but also they didn't adapt themselves. And when we went to the bench, the, the sort of players that I felt we needed to break them down weren't there either. And... I, I can't. I, I can see that being an issue going forward. I, I said I could be completely wrong, but my instincts tell me that this team is two or three creative players away from being able to break down teams at home. And the other person who's been heavily linked with us at the moment is Carl Baker, and he's just saying, "Well, just having." I'm not, not going to say I'm a biggest fan. I'm not. Everyone knows I'm not. But just having someone on the pitch on Saturday who's a bit of a live wire, who was going to have shots from 25 yards, who was committing players, would have been far better than Vincenzi, who, who was stumbling over the ball and, and not really helping. And it's Baker's how a good I'm... example of a player who's been let go of a, a, from a cl- club who, um, you know, from afar you look at him and think, oh, he's gone. 
And actually, he was still a good player when he left. So it's kind of that, not saying that Vicente's a good player, because I don't know, but it's just because Keith Hill let him go doesn't necessarily mean that that's, that's the definitive view on him as well. Not to keep playing devil's advocate with you, Paul, but I just I feel like we're, we're so early on and there's just so many sort of variants at the moment where it's just it's very hard to get too overwrought by certain things because there's just until I mean we always talk about the ten game thing until we've seen yeah. like a, a, a period of time where we've seen the ups and downs and we've seen sort of players kind of get a, a feel for things then then we might be in a bit a bit of a better position to. Um, sort of have some genuine concerns. Neil, who would you start with up front on uh, on Saturday? Um, I I would... This is a bit out there, but I wouldn't mind seeing Tony and the Duck up front. That would, strangely enough, be my preference, albeit, the, again, to your point about seeing players too often. I don't want to see it like I'm sort of um, jumping too quickly. I thought... I'm a simple man and have quite rudimentary tastes, and I quite like the idea that I mean, I saw, I saw a type of player in Andrew, and the way that the duck has been described as quick and burly and dynamic. That I can, I can get my head around that. I can comprehend those things more than it may well be that McNulty is too subtle from what I've seen so far, and he might have all this great nuance. But I think I'd be interested to see. New Tony and the Duck, um, even if it's just for you know the fact that we love them both already. Paul, have you got um, what? Who would you start with on Saturday? I'd I'd bring Kwame and he scored two in the under twenty threes. Well, Did possibly, he? yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. I keep thinking and he's I, injured still. Well, I'm, I'm assuming he must be fully fit. He's played in the last two under twenty threes. So, and I, I as I said, I, my my thing with McNulty, Maxime, and. Um, Bevan is, I, I just think they're too similar. So if you're going to keep one of those, you can play New Tony. But I, yeah, I mean, I'm like everyone else. I'd play New Tony and, and Duck because I want to see interesting footballs do interesting things. I don't want to yeah. see, you know, and I, 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 I'm still, and I, I think, um, I, I think Robin's got it wrong. And I, I just think if he'd have bought, if, if he'd have bought the Duck on and he'd been shit, no one would have come away and gone, I'll tell you what, he should have brought Maxime on. And I think that's what annoys me, is the fact that it was just, the, the, from what we've seen, he is just a player who would have tried to make to impact on the game. And Maxime, for me, just doesn't look ready yet. And we've discussed that. Because he's made that step up from non-league, he's literally only about six weeks into, his league, into being a professional footballer. And we saw that with Stokes. It's just such a massive step up from training twice a week to training four times a week. And the workload and everything else on top of it, I'm not sure that Maxime is ready yet to be brought on in the game that we're losing for him to be the hero. But the Duck looks like the sort of player who would thrive in that situation. Right, let's um, let's throw in Dominic's uh, Yeovil preview at this point, and then we'll come back and do some listener questions, and then we'll wrap things up. Unless anybody has anything burning that they feel hasn't been said that they want to get off their chest. No, enough for me. Fabulous. Uh, right, here's Dominic talking about Yeovil. Hello, Dominic. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's good to be on the show. Um, let's do Yeovil then. So lots and lots of goals scored in your games involving Yeovil so far. How do you think they'll do this season? Well, Yeovil, sort of like Newport last week, are sort of one of those smaller clubs in League 2 with small crowds, small budget, remote location and always sort of churning through players each season. It's crazy to think that uh, just a few seasons ago they are in the Championship. There's just... There's just no remnants, no um, no legacy from that time there. Tumbled through the leagues and um, that hasn't been a happy place to be, really. Sort of, there's a bit of a malaise around the club. I mean, that 8-2 defeat against Lincoln, uh, Luton on the opening day, um, they moved pretty heavily over the season. I know they reacted fairly well to the loss in, um, in beating Appleton 3-2. And just for that, they uh, lost 1-0 to Wolves in the League Cup. But last week, we were 2-0 and then 3-1 up against Forest Green and completely blew it. So there's still a level of mental fragility around the squad and not a great atmosphere in the club. So 
I'd imagine they are one of the favourites for the drop. Um, which of their players should we look out for, would you say? Well, clearly none of their defenders. <laughs> um, but, um, but their front three um, is, has been particularly good. They've scored, they've scored a lot of goals this season. There has been the play of uh, Francois Zoko, Odefeda, Onomona and Otis Khan that has been really eye-catching. Zoko um, is more experienced out of those three. He's sort of one of those sort of mercurial lower league forwards who, for some reason, never really seems to do the business at a bigger club, but if you stick him in a small club, he's he's someone you kind of build a side around. Uh, Ottawa is on loan Southampton and has played uh, at youth level for England and seems a bit of a coup signing for Yeovil. Uh, he scored three and three thus far and if you can use that this way, I don't think he's going to be at Yeovil longer than his loan spell. Sort of more of a pacey striker than Zoko. And then for Khan, he's he's a more of a winger. Um, when Yeovil were good last season, he was he was instrumental in that. But he picked up an injury, which is probably the reason why he didn't go on to move to a bigger club over the summer. But again, he's picked up where his form was last season. So definitely watch out for those three. Okay, and how would you expect them to set up? Well, I think they are going to be a bit hard to predict um, just because of those defensive struggles. Last week, they changed to a 3-4-3 system and basically emphasis was just give the ball to those three uh, attacking players and see what they can do, which worked until um, they tried to sit on the lead and they were just an absolute shambles defensively. So you don't know uh, how it's how it's going to inform the manager's thinking. Sort of a bit like how uh, Stephen Pressey was after losing Leon Clark. Sort of that balance between defence and attack clearly isn't right. They could try and change something really radical, but I'd imagine there's going to be a lot of emphasis on giving the ball to Onomada, Zoko and Khan. OK, and do you have any predictions? What are you going to go for? Well, leaving the overall aside for a second, I think this game really is going to be... be about our reaction to that Newport result last week. Uh, does Robbins make loads of changes, decide, do we let the pressure start to get to us, uh, or do we just dust ourselves off and pick up where we were against Grimsby? Um, I mean, this really could be an ideal game to get back in, get back into our strengths. The overall could end up leaving quite a lot of space for us to exploit defensively. Players like Andreo Jones and the Duck uh, could really... Have, uh, have some joy there so I think this is a game we should win I'm going to go for a 3-1 win and as we all know by now my um, my prediction is about <laughs> as good as uh, so yeah it's quite, on that. it's quite unfair making you do predictions because I think everybody realises that they're redundant but that I think also people like the security of hearing someone make a prediction let's just um, have a quick, look, a quick minute or so on the game on Saturday which I assume we were at How did, what did you think of Tony Andrew when he came on? Uh, I, I was really impressed by him it's that tight control that he has and sort of just Sort of a drive and forward momentum to his game that was that was really eye catching and it was just what the team needed. Um, and I, one of the things I expect that we'll talk about um, in the pod itself was the choice to bring Biamu on as the third uh, substitute. Any thoughts on that? Um, well, I know we haven't seen a great deal of Biamu to judge on, but it does seem a bit crazy to me that. Um, He's getting game time over Kwame Thomas. That seems a bit weird because I'd imagine they both sort of offer a similar thing to the side, sort of that big guy who's sort of trying to make, uh, trying to sort of influence the game like that. And Biamro just didn't offer that. And Kwame Thomas, I mean, I'm not a, a massive fan of his. I think there are, he's got big things to improve in his game, but I, it's, it's the effort and in his game and sort of the running which is what you really want to see. And he is someone who can potentially change a game like that just by running around and causing uh, defences to question themselves, really. Um, good stuff. OK, well, we'll speak to you again next week. Hopefully your prediction will come true this week. Hopefully. Uh, thanks very much. OK, that's all right.
Okay, thank you, Dominic. So then, listener questions. We let's start with Martin Coleman. Um, Neil, he asks, does Kelly actually try to look like Klingon before coming out of the tunnel? I had problems with this. I thought he looked very much like Klingon, but I think it's probably just because Doyle's next to him. I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask about Klingon because I feel like I was the only one in the world who actually liked him as a player, even in that last season. So he, there was an air of him about him, wasn't there, in that in that game. This was very he's... specifically about aesthetics. Oh, just literally how he looks. I thought, he, yeah, he really reminded me of Klingon in the way that he looked. But admittedly, I am sort of renowned for not being able to see players. But, but my eyesight seems to die a death when I'm trying to observe which <laughs> on a football pitch. Well, I guess that would be a first, wouldn't it? Someone wanting to be Sammy Klingon in looks. But um, there's always a time for a first, so I wouldn't blame him. Um, Dan Malia asks about thoughts on the rumours Carl Baker returning we've sort of talked about that but just to go around the table would anybody have him back Neil would you have him back I think to Paul's point we lack creativity so we're, we're more than alert to what um, Carl Baker can do so I wouldn't have an issue with him coming back I don't think we need to strain ourselves to get him back I mean I don't know how old he is now is he 34 I would have thought 35, 35 perhaps I'll google that while Paul tells us whether he would have him back yeah. or not so really? it's coming. It's coming to that point in his career, though, where we've we've seen it so often before. It's kind of so abrupt, and we tend to be the club that um, finds that abrupt point where they just can't do it anymore. So it's, it's going to be a punt, whatever, isn't it? Uh, Paul, would you have him back? We need someone of that type. We just desperately need someone with a bit of crazy. I'm just going to try it attitude. And yeah, we. I'd, if it was a choice of him and Vincenzi on the right left wing, there's, there's no real option in my eyes. You make we'd a good win, point. We'd, we'd win fewer headers, but I can cope with that out of a left <laughs> winger. Um, I, I don't want to get on Vincenzi's back yet. Um, albeit that it would be nice to be that high up. <laughs> um, but the, I just think, uh, to Neil's point, I think there may well be a player in there. And I also wonder whether his value will be proved in odd games and whether it will be coming off the bench and other things like that. But it was, like you say, it was very noticeable and unfortunately incredibly predictable how much we preferred going down the right. And there's a little element of... We've talked about this loads of times. It's hard to play well or badly when you're not as frequently involved in the game. And you would almost hazard a thing to say that Jody Jones played worse than Vincenzi last on Saturday because of how much went wrong for him but he had it all on his shoulders and that so little yeah. went down there um, so I don't want to say oh well anyone's better than Vincenzi so I'd have Baker I as as basic as it sounds I don't I haven't seen him in the last few years but you still get the impression he wasn't lightning quick to begin with was he so I don't think there would be that element lost off. And I do think he really, really, really would like to play for the club, wouldn't he? Yeah. Didn't, didn't he still get about 10 goals last season? I'm not entirely sure. But I think he's, you know, he's, he's no slouch, is he? I mean, the other thing is, it's like, I know you can only go off these things, but all the Pompey, well, m- most of the Pompey fans, you're obviously not the one who called him an ass, but a lot of Pompey fans were like really sort of, you know, we want you back, you should be back in the team. I, so by the, by the looks of it, it's not like he's he's out the team because he's gone off. A, the manager just doesn't fancy him at a higher level. That you know that does happen where you get promoted, and we all know that Baker has his his frailties as well as his strengths. Where he can have periods where he just gives the ball away endlessly. But I think in League Two, again, I, I, I'm getting to cope with that. I, the, my other thing with the Vincenzi thing is just he doesn't look comfortable at the moment and. It's how it is. Literally, it's just a, it's a time thing, isn't it? It's like, do we just give him ten games, and then if he hasn't improved to ten games, make a decision? Or if in during those ten games you see no progression, do you drop him? Because the other thing that is obviously is becoming pertinent, and it's going to become more and more pertinent as the game goes on, especially as we have the majority of Cod fans down one side of the pitch. For 45 minutes, he's going to be clearly in view of 90% of the Cov fans. And we know that Cov fans do like sort of slagging people off, mm. even if they're George Thomas. So 
I think it's it's very much aware in people's minds. And it's not, you know, it's nothing to do with us who are discussing it. It's you go on Twitter straight away and there are a lot of people discuss, discussing his performance. I think he doesn't, he, because he's six foot four, he, or six or whatever, he does stand out. And I think he's going to be under the microscope a lot, lot more than some of the others. So to some extent, that, that pressure is only going to mount if people continue to see a lack of, development towards a level that I said I've seen him play at before Jerry's point about the bench is a good one I think I, I often think that our view I say our view sort of football's view of how the bench should be used is quite sort of interesting because it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing I mean I had a bit of a discussion about this at the weekend where um, people couldn't quite understand my viewpoint and that actually it's it's a team and it's a squad and actually some people are just much better at coming off bench in the same way that where you have sort of power plays in in american sports and stuff like that it's kind of how you deal with all your different sort of units and i wouldn't have an issue with him kind of being that alternative person coming off the bench and it shouldn't necessarily always be a negative that someone's on the bench in the same way that nays on if you're going to actually use him that wouldn't be the worst thing to give someone like that to be able to come on and finish off a game with um, 15 minutes to go that's that's a good thing and it's probably more valuable to us than him playing 60 minutes and then coming off I think, well, we, also, I think we forget sorry, you're, that it's... You've also got the Clive Platt scenario, where if you have someone who is a bit awkward like Clive Platt, if you're losing, he's useful to come on because he can be a menace and cause he's a different type of striker. And sometimes if you're winning, he's useful to come on because he can hold the ball up. So, yeah, I mean, I think... I think I think actually over the next five ten years I think you're going to see that progression a bit more where you get specialist guys in the same way that rugby union very much is now it's like they are people who who are built only to last an hour and then they basically replace them with like for the last twenty minutes yeah. it's like why not have someone who is just lightning quick and you say look every time you get it you do this you burn yourself off after half um, sixty minutes and then for half an hour. We've got another quick lad. Once you've terrorised your fullback or you've terrorised the centre half, or you've moved him around, we've got this other guy who's quite similar who we'll bring on for half an hour, who's as fresh as anything and will continue to do the same job that you've done, but will be against a tired defence. And that's exactly. basically your job. Yeah, I, I think that's perfectly. And I think that's what disappointed me on Saturday was what situation was going to need that we were going to need both James Pearson and um, Hyam, and then Willis went off. And we brought neither of them on. So <laughs> it, it's just a case of there was never going to be a situation where we needed both of them. Unless, you know, it, OK, it does happen every so often. You, have, you need two center outs, But it's highly unlikely. And then you think, well, with Dion Kelly Evans, I know he's a fullback, but he is someone who's going to get forward and give me another option. So I'd rather have that, you know, I, I said it for me, it was the lack of wide players. It was the fact if Vincenzi didn't have a good game, who can we bring on on the left wing who's naturally a left winger or can fit naturally on that left hand side? And I know we're going to see in the future that Tony, New Tony's going to play on one of the wings, and that might be his natural fit. He might just end up on the left wing because we have no other option. But I'd like to see us have that other option. Um, final listener questions. It actually feels like we have answered most of these. Ian Heron asks if Tony starts. If new Tony starts next game, who does he replace? I feel like we've done that. Um, Laurie, lonely season. Laurie says, do we need to play our best attacking players at home to avoid a season of bus parking one nil defeats to tourists? I think again, Paul, you talked about it with the difference <laughs> that Ben Stevenson made. And Chris Farrelly asks, are we too quick to denounce goalkeepers? We've been remarkably um, forward-thinking in our conversation topics, haven't we? But the most ironic thing about the goalkeeper situation, if we've dropped Liam O'Brien, we're going to bring in Lee Burge, who most Cov fans haven't forgiven for fucking up against um, (laughs) Worcester. Yeah. Maybe they're missing out on the opportunity to complain too much. So I, I, I just feel for... O'Brien, because, I th- as we discussed I, n- numerous times in the past, everyone gave the war, you know, everyone on the pitch made lots more mistakes than O'Brien did, but O'Brien makes the one that's the most obvious, and that's just the what it is just the goalkeepers, you know, no one can remember, Michael made some absolute clangers, some absolutely hilarious clangers, 
but no one remembers it. And I think if Liam O'Brien comes back and has a good game against Yeovil, you know, people quickly move on from to slagging off someone else. Um, yeah, and we will move on to next week where we will inevitably be slagging off other people. So let's wrap things up. Neil, what's going on on Sky Blues blog? A uh, bunch of stuff. Previews still. Um, getting a few contributions in as well. So head on over to there. Skyblues.co.uk um, And it's sidewayssammy.wordpress.com if you want to read uh, Dominic's match preview in greater detail than the one that he gave us via audio. Um, and someone who we've sort of done bits with before, a guy called Halley Inc. or Hawley Inc. H-A-L-L-Y-I-N-K dot com who does really really good cov illustrations posters prints pin badges things like that he's got a sale on at the minute which is 50 percent off uh it's halley inc uh dot com uh and all the details are on there but his stuff is really 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 good so it's worth checking out um i think that's everything isn't it we're done yeah i think so yeah right thank you paul cheers mate thank you neil and we'll speak to you all next week. Bye!